Welcome in. This is the second in a two-part video series, and in it we're going to take the summed squared error that we just studied in the previous video and apply it to the exclusive OR or XOR problem. I'm Dr. Aliana Moren. Right now, let's move on to our next example, which is the classic XOR problem. In the XOR problem, you train a neural network to distinguish four different data sets. There's 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. In the case of the 0, 0, and 1, 1 inputs, you want the neural network to give you, in this case we're using two output nodes, we want a 0 for the first with the 0th output node, and a 1 for the next, and in the other case, the 0, 1, or 1, 0 inputs, we want a 1 output in that first 0th node, and a 0 in the second case. Let's take a look at how this can be accomplished. Let's examine the case where our inputs are the 0, 1 case, and let's just pretend that somehow we've managed to activate both hidden nodes. Now each of those nodes is going to send an input to each, respectively, of the 0 and the 1. That's the 1, 2 nodes, counting them, but Python style 0, 1 nodes in the output layer. Now let's suppose that our connection weights are already such that we send a positive value from h sub 0 up to o sub 0, and a negative value from h sub 1 up to the same o sub 0. So we're sending in two numbers, one positive, one negative. Let's assume that they more or less cancel each other out. So in this particular instance, we have a case where at the beginning of training, we're sending in positive and negative values into the output node and approximately canceling each other out. So we're giving a value that's close to zero into the transfer function. What that means, given that we're using a sigmoidal transfer function here, is that the output of the transfer function is about 0 0.5. Now this is not at all unusual. When we start training a neural network, we're liable to have both positive and negative values going into any one of those output nodes, simply because the weights haven't been trained yet. So they'll tend to cancel each other out and will typically, typically get an output value of about 0 0.5 prior to training. So let's take a look at what our likely SSE will be, given that we're putting in values of approximately 0 into the out output nodes, into each of them. And that means that the output node activations, after the transfer function has been applied, are approximately 0.5 each. Now, for each of those output nodes, we want the error term. The error term is going to be your target or desired activation minus the actual. So in each case, you're going to have either a 1 or a 0 minus the 0 0.5. You're going to get a result of either 0.5 or minus 0.5 square them because we want sum of squared errors, so you get a 0.25 in each case. Add them together, we've got two output nodes, so we add them, and we get 0.5. If you set up your program so that what you're dealing with is the sum of the sum squared error across multiple different training sets, then you're going to sum those SSEs. In this case, we have four different training data sets, so we sum up the values of 0 0.5 four times and get a value of 2.0. What happens next depends on how you set up your computer program. So let's sum up what we figured out so far about sum squared error and the sum of the sum squared error. First of all, the sum squared error is going to be dependent on the number of output nodes. It's going to be approximately, before training, the number of output nodes times 0.5 because that'll be the typical output before the neural network gets trained. Then, if you've written your computer program so that the stopping criteria is that the sum of the sum squared error across your different kinds of training data, so each class of training data, uh, has to hit a certain value, then you could see that particular sum of the SSEs being something, in this case, like 2.0, because it's not just that you're summing across a given training data set, it's all your different training data sets. Now that is particular to how you've written the program. Now let's take a look at what happens after you've done training. All of a sudden the error rates drop. 
So let's suppose that you've gotten your error rates down to approximately 0.2 instead of 0.5 in each case. And they can be positive or negative values. That doesn't matter because the next thing that we do is square them and in each case get a squared value of 0.4. Now we sum those squared error values across each of the output nodes. And in this case, we're having approximately 0.04 summed over two nodes, and we get 0.08. Now what happens next depends again on how you've set up your program. If all that you're doing is saying that your SSE, some squared error, in any one instance has to be less than a certain value, like for example 0.1, then as soon as you hit that first value of 0.08, you could stop right there. And that would say that in one of your training data cases, you've had an error that is approximately 0.2 in each of those cases, giving you a total SSE of 0.08. And that's okay. Or you might have set up your program to look at the sum squared error across all your different training data sets, in which case you'd be getting an accumulated value of 4, because you have 4 training data sets, uh, times the 0.08 or 0.32 then you would want to assess what you want to have your stopping criteria to be dependent on that. Let's recap some squared error. For an untrained neural network, for a given node within that network, the error term is likely going to be either positive or negative 0.5. Then the squared error will be likely around the neighborhood of 0.25. To get the some squared error, you multiply 0.25 by the total number of nodes in the output layer. If your program is written so that you are summing your sum squared error across multiple different classes and you're alternating or randomly choosing the class for training but keeping track of the sum of the SSEs for each of those different classes, then you multiply that value of the SSE by the number of different classes that you've got. Now after training, Figure the kind of error that you are willing to accept in each of those nodes. I was using the, the example of 0.2. You square that, you sum across the total number of nodes, and then that would be your acceptable SSE. So it's a good way to track how your training is progressing. Even though I've used the example of 0.2 for a trained neural network, that is really still a pretty high error rate. So typically, you would use that only as a rough training to get the process started to see how the network is performing. After that, you would refine your neural network training process and demand that it hit 0.1 or even lower. Keep in mind, the example used here for the XOR problem is actually a difficult problem for the neural network. Most classification tasks are going to be a little bit easier to train but you'll want a much tighter error bar. Thank you for joining me. I hope you've had a good time. I've certainly enjoyed being with you. What we've done in these two videos, the first one on the more theoretical aspect and the second on doing a walkthrough, applying the SSE or sum squared error to the XOR problem, is to get a pretty good handle on how it is that we set up the sum squared error term for our back propagation training. We now know how to assess the initial SSE that we could see as our neural network just starts its training. We can assess how well the network has performed with this training when we look at SSEs down the training line. And we also have a pretty good sense of what kind of values to use as cutoffs to stop training. Thank you for joining me. I'm looking forward to seeing you in future vids.